Good morning. Welcome to the launch for the National Foundation for Educational Research's Teacher Labour Market in England Report 2021. For those of you who are not familiar with NFER's work, NFER's mission is to improve outcomes for future generations everywhere and to support positive change across education systems. Funded by the Nuffield Foundation, NFER has carried out research to gain a deeper understanding of the dynamics within the teacher workforce in England. My name is Cheryl Lloyd and I'm chairing the event today. I'm a programme head in the education team at the Nuffield Foundation and we're very pleased to be funding the project we're going to hear about today. Before we start properly, I want to let you know that if you have any technical issues during the event, please message the host through the chat panel, which is at the bottom right hand of your screen. Today's event is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be available on the NFER website afterwards. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to say a few words about the Nuffield Foundation's interest in this topic. At the Nuffield Foundation, teaching quality is a key theme that runs through our portfolio from early years education onwards recognising the importance of having sufficient, suitably qualified teachers to delivering and improving the quality of teaching and learning for children and young people. As a result, our work in this area has a particular focus on teacher supply, the role of professional development and the characteristics of effective teaching. For some years before the COVID-19 pandemic, England's school system has been facing an increasingly severe challenge, recruiting and retaining enough teachers to meet the growing demand. Over the last year, we have seen profound impacts on society, the economy and education sector, including on teacher workload, day to day teaching and on recruitment and retention. Today, we're going to hear new insights from in-depth analysis on the short term impacts of the pandemic on the teacher workforce, the longer term challenges and how these can be tackled. The format of today's event is that we're going to start with a presentation from Jack Wirt, who leads NFER's work on the school workforce. We'll then hear responses of up to five minutes from our three panellists. And our panellists are going to be Emma Hollis, who is Executive Director of the National Association of School-Based Teacher Trainers, Im Buckham, who is Chair of Ofqual, CEO and Director of 10X Schools Trust and lead of the DfE's ITT Market Review, and Dame Allison, Professor Dame Alison Peacock, Chief Executive of the Chartered College of Teaching. Following this, we'll have time for a Q&A session before bringing the seminar to a close. If you would like to submit a question, please do so using the chat panel, which is at the bottom of the screen, and send your messages to the person marked as host, who is Matt working behind the scenes. And if your question is for a specific panellist, please do say this when you submit your question. So without any further delay, I'm very pleased to pass over to Jack, who's going to tell us about his findings. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that's visible to everybody. Cheryl's nodding, so that's all good. Uh, thank you very much, Cheryl, for your introduction uh, and to the Nuffield Foundation for supporting this research. Uh, and thank you all for joining us this morning uh, to discuss these important things. Uh, so just over a year ago, we had the 2020 Teacher Labour Market in England annual report finished and ready to go. Uh, an event arranged at Nuffield's uh, office in London. Um, but as the pandemic intensified throughout March, we had to postpone the report launch. So the report drew on the latest data to describe the substantial and growing challenge of ensuring that there are sufficient numbers of high quality teachers employed in schools. Growing secondary pupil numbers and a strong graduate labour market were making this challenging, but the data did seem to be pointing to some signs of improvement. But as the country had been engulfed by the COVID crisis, uh, it just made the relevance of these issues seem a lot more distant in the immediate uh, of, of March last year. By the time the report was finally published in June 2020, it was kind of describing a world that no longer really existed. Schools have been closed to all but key worker children for more than two months, uh, and COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on society, uh, on the economy, uh, and of course on education. By then it was also already becoming clear that a lot of the report's content was already out of date. Uh, as the economic crisis became increasingly apparent, the number of applications to teacher training was surging through the summer, hinting that the teacher supply challenge may be about to ease. So this year's report is an opportunity to take stock of the momentous year that we've been through. Uh, the focus of the research remains very much on teachers uh, and school leaders, 
on teacher supply, the labour market and working conditions. Uh, in a year that's been challenging for so many people, we place an extended focus on the topic of teachers' well-being. So we draw on data from two household surveys that are uniquely well-placed to, to quantify and study the impact of the pandemic on teachers' well-being. These are the UK Household Longitudinal Study, also known as Understanding Society, uh, and the Labour Force Survey and the Annual Population Survey. So there are three key advantages of these surveys and why we've used them. So they use consistent measures over time, meaning that we can baseline to pre-pandemic levels and clearly see and quantify the impact on well-being. Um, they've had continuous data collection throughout the pandemic, which enables us to see how the situation has evolved through 2020. Um, and they measure a sample of the UK whole population. So as well as charting the impact on teachers, we can assess the impact on individuals in other professions as well. And this enables to ask us to answer the question of whether there was a particular impact on teachers or whether the impacts were more generally felt. So we identify a group that we call similar professionals with exactly the same age, sex, region and highest qualification characteristics to our group of teachers. So a limitation of these data sets is that the sample sizes are relatively small, but they're large enough to conduct robust analysis of the comparisons and the trends. So we also explore the impact of the economic fallout from the pandemic and it, the impact it's had on teacher supply using monthly data from UCAS about teacher training applications, which gives us an early sight of what the recruitment picture is looking like in 2021. So NFER have also been conducting a lot of primary research through the pandemic. Um, colleagues conducted two surveys of teachers and senior leaders during the period of school closures uh, in May and July, which is funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Uh, and in the autumn, we also conducted a survey of senior leaders in primary and secondary schools, which focused on how the pandemic had changed teacher recruitment and retention. Uh, the responses from more than 800 schools give a really rich picture of the impact the pandemic has had from a school perspective. So we start with teachers' well-being. Um, the general health questionnaire uh, GHQ12 uh, is a measure with 12 questions about subjective well-being. So respondents were asked about their ability to concentrate, make decisions, overcome difficulties, and the extent to which they felt unhappy or under strain. The more negative statements are scored more highly, so higher scores correspond to lower well-being, and the average varies between 0 and 36. So as we can see in this chart, there was no significant difference between the average score of teachers and similar professionals prior to the pandemic. Uh, but the data clearly shows that the subjective well-being of both groups deteriorated after the first lockdown began. So the average teacher jumped up by 1.4 points. Similar professionals, though, experienced a greater rise in their level of subjective distress than teachers during the pandemic. So they increased by three, uh, three points in April compared to the 2018-19 average. The average GHQ scores of similar professionals were significantly higher than teachers in both April and at the end of July, um, which was when teachers uh, were on summer holidays, admittedly. But the trends in well-being for both groups show that well-being improved throughout the summer, um, but remained above the pre-pandemic trend. Um, but teachers' level of subjective distress rose considerably during the 2020 autumn term to the same level as similar professionals by November, which had also seen an increase. So the Office for National Statistics also has a selection of well-being measures that it uses to measure national well-being. They measure anxiety, happiness, life satisfaction, and feeling that things someone does are worthwhile. So this chart shows the average anxiety levels of teachers and similar professionals for pre-pandemic period. So there are no differences between the groups and the trends were pretty flat. However, um, anxiety rose dramatically in March for both groups. So again, we can see that it eased from then onwards, uh, although there was a small blip upwards in May for teachers uh, when there was a lot of talk around of schools reopening. Teacher anxiety was lowest in July, which is almost certainly another summer holiday effect, um, but rose again in August and September as schools prepared to fully reopen. So interestingly, there was a very similar pattern in teacher tap data, 
uh, which had much larger sample sizes. So this shows the teacher tap data where you can see the spikes in March, in May, and then again in September. The larger sample sizes allowed them to break the data down further than we can, uh, which reveals the particularly heavy impact the last year has had on senior leaders' anxiety. So leaders have had a huge amount to deal with uh, and deserve enormous praise for the vital role they've played and, and that they continue to play. So the ONS data also shows that there was a fall in happiness across both groups in March, which then eased throughout the year. Another summer holidays effect for teachers, but the level in September has returned to just below the pre-pandemic level. So taken together, the findings on well-being indicate that teachers experienced lower well-being, life satisfaction and happiness, and higher anxiety as an immediate result of the lockdown. But while the impacts lessened during the summer, uh, the data we have indicates that there's a likely rise in the autumn term and perhaps into 2021 as well. However, there's no indication of teachers having worse well-being outcomes than similar professionals, and even some tentative evidence of teachers having comparatively higher well-being in 2020. And this echoes um, some of John Jerram's work, uh, which uh, again was with the Nuffield Foundation. So a fantastically comprehensive study of teachers' well-being, looking at a number of different data sets, which were all pre-pandemic, which showed similar findings that teachers don't generally have lower well-being than those working in other professions. Uh, and again, this just reiterates it that it's kind of a more general effect that's affected um, lots of people across across the population. So what happened to teachers' working hours during the pandemic? Uh, Labour force survey data shows that before the pandemic, teachers were working more hours in a working week than similar professionals, albeit similar hours over the course of a year once the school holidays are taken into account. So during the period of school closures from March to May, full-time teachers' average working hours fell to 39 hours, which was roughly the same as similar professionals. So the hours were similar during the period of partial opening during the end of the summer term. Um, and there may be a number of reasons why working hours fell during the spring and summer, uh, including teachers' childcare responsibilities um, or constraints on teachers' ability to work from home, like their um, access to IT facilities. But in the autumn term, when schools fully opened, teachers' working hours returned to their pre-pandemic level at around 46 hours per week. This was significantly more on average than the 41 reported by full-time similar professionals during the same period. So it seems like we've returned to normality in the autumn term. So workload has been prominent in education policy for many years, uh, but teachers' workload is not measured simply by working hours. Um, it's also about how teachers feel about the work they do and the expectations placed on them. So the Labour Force survey data suggests that despite teachers working fewer hours during the March to July period than normally, there was no significant fall in the proportion of teachers, full-time teachers, saying that they wanted to work fewer hours. Uh, there's still a gap between teachers and similar professionals. There's another question in the Labour Force survey about working hours, which is, regardless of how many hours they worked in the previous week, how many hours do they work in a normal working week? So interestingly, the data was very similar to actual hours prior to the pandemic, but showed no dip during March to July. So teachers' perceptions of their usual working hours have barely changed and remain significantly higher compared to similar professionals. Um, and they also tend to still regard their working hours as being too many. So prior to the pandemic, teacher workload and well-being were among the government's top priority policy uh, for policy. Now, clearly, the world has changed in many ways and focus has rightly shifted to what the post pandemic recovery phase looks like for students who have missed out on so much face to face teaching. Um, but teacher workload and well-being does need to remain front and centre in those recovery plans because it wouldn't be sustainable or desirable for a recovery plan to be dependent on adding to teachers already high workloads. So our findings show that while teachers' well-being had deteriorated as a result of the pandemic, this impact was shared with similar professionals, and other studies have shown a similar picture across the population. Our analysis of GHQ data even shows that teachers' well-being may even have been less negatively affected than similar professionals. So 
what are the potential protective factors um, for teachers? Well, so one of them is job security. But teaching is often referred to as recession proof. The demand for teachers is driven primarily by people numbers, policy needs and school funding and is there, therefore pretty much independent of the state of the economy. So COVID-19 has caused widespread instability and insecurity within the labour market. Uh, it hasn't shown up in the unemployment rate yet, uh, largely because of the furlough scheme, but it's certainly there. So we chart the recent history of teaching's job security premium. So straight after the 2008 recession, teachers reported higher levels of job security compared to similar professionals. But then that eroded over the decade to nothing as the labour market recovered, which was likely one of the contributors to why the teacher supply challenge grew so much in the latter part of the decade. Um, but teachers, uh, sorry, data from the uh, Understanding Society survey, which uses a completely different measure, which is why it's plotted separately, showed that a job security premium has re-emerged. So less than a quarter of teachers felt any job insecurity at all compared to near a half of similar professionals. And as this chart shows, on average, teachers perceived a 5% chance of losing their job in the next three months, while for similar professionals that hit 10% over the summer when the furlough seem, scheme seemed to be coming to an end. Research by Natsen has shown a relationship between job insecurity and lower GHQ wellbeing, which provides this link to it being a protective factor for teachers. So high job security also explains what's been going on in teacher recruitment. Um, an opti optimistic part of all of us wants to believe that people have been inspired by teachers' dedication during the pandemic to want to be teachers. Um, but I think the uncertain economic backdrop provides a bit more of a compelling explanation. Uh, and indeed, you see in previous recessions that uh, recruitment has, has surged in similar ways. So this chart shows how the 2019 cycle of recruitment to ITT unfolded. Um, at the end of the cycle, recruitment overall for secondary and in several subjects was below target. So up until April in 2020, the numbers were following a very similar trend, but surged over the summer as the economic uncertainty became increasingly apparent. By the end of the cycle, applications were 20% higher than they were in 2019. The numbers for 2021 have continued to be strong as well, in spite of some policy changes that I'll discuss in a minute. So the latest data for February shows that applications are 26% higher than the, the same point in 2020, which was of course pre-pandemic. So we're on track for another year of quite healthy recruitment. Now those increases in 2020 affected all subjects, uh, but were not uniform across subjects. Uh, there were increases for shortage subjects like maths, modern foreign languages, chemistry, um, that moved them closer to meeting their targets, uh, but physics barely moved at all. There were also big increases for subjects that had met their targets in the previous year, increasing the level of supply over and above what was required to meet the demand that was projected. So this created a bit of a dilemma for policymakers, as some of these non-shortage subjects still had bursaries, which were potentially uh, fueling that over-recruitment. So the government announced much lower bursaries for 2021, removing some of them, like English, geography and history entirely, uh, and others like biology and classics being reduced dramatically. Maths, physics, chemistry, computing were all maintained at quite relatively high level, although the early career payments for maths and science were removed. So these dramatic bursary changes do provide a unique window into assessing how effective bursaries are in driving recruitment behaviour, and it turns out they're quite powerful. So this chart shows the growth in applications by subject this year, with the amount of bursary reduction. And you can see that subjects with the largest bursary reductions have seen the smallest increases in applications, or in some cases, uh, falls on the levels that they've seen the same, same time last year. Whereas maintaining bursaries for maths, physics and computing have contributed to strong rises. Now, one or two subjects stand out in the data as outliers. So this chart plots the recruitment level uh, from the previous year against the bursary changes and shows that MFL and uh, design technology have large bursary reductions, even in spite of being below target in 2020. The rest of the data is kind of as you would expect with larger bursary reductions for subjects that over recruited in 2020. So what's going on? Well, this is pure speculation, but the MFL bursary change may indicate uh, a policy change around EVAC. So this 
uh, chart is taken from the DFE's teacher supply model. Uh, and the two lines show the effect of the EBAC target on the number of new MFL teachers that we need to enter the system to maintain supply. So this is analysis for 2020, which shows that we needed 59% increase in new entrants over and above the kind of level needed to re just replace teachers. Um, <clears throat> seeing as MFL was below the target last year, uh, it seems that the same analysis now would show an even steeper increase. Uh, needing more MFL teachers to kind of meet that target of the entry. Um, so the bursary change doesn't quite logically fit uh, without some change to the EVAC target. So that may be uh, what's what's driving some of that. But COVID-19 has also affected ITT recruitment in several other ways. So first, the, the ITT targets that were set for 2020 are likely to overestimate the system's actual need for new teachers um, because retention is likely to have been lower. So while we don't have hard evidence of that in the school workforce census yet, the survey evidence we have indicates that fewer teachers are likely to have left in the summer than would otherwise have been expected. So our new survey data from the autumn term confirms this picture. So more primary senior leaders said that turnover had fallen compared to those that said it had increased. A lot said it was similar, but then it's quite hard to tell for a quite small staff in a small primary school. So as a result, primary schools have reduced their amount of recruitment compared to what they would have done in a normal year. And the same picture is true for secondary schools, where half of schools reported reduced turnover and very few saw an increase. So another emerging issue is with capacity to train new teachers. So all teachers need practical experience of teaching in a school-based placement. But our July survey of senior leaders indicated that schools had reduced their offers of capacity for training them in 2021. Our autumn survey uh, confirms the same picture, that reduced capacity has remained in place. So we also asked schools for about their considerations they'd made about their plans and the strategies that might encourage them to take more trainees. So the most significant factors for primaries were concerns about the burden on school staff to provide support for trainees, uh, and also uh, having too many people, different, different people on site. So the issue of the burden on staff on, uh, to support trainees was also important for secondary schools. But secondary leaders also recognised the benefits of TT placements uh, for supporting their recruitment and succession planning, um, as did a quarter of primary leaders. So a lack of mentor capacity does appear to be a significant factor affecting schools placement capacity. Senior leaders, uh, sorry, senior teachers uh, just have limited time and multiple calls on that time. But this is an emerging problem for the system, uh, especially as the early career framework introduces a greater minimum entitlement for teachers in their second year in terms of mentoring. The national rollout for September is likely to put additional strain on the capacity that we can see here. So we think that the government uh, needs to look at how to engage schools with ITT uh, and take action to ensure that capacity for the supporting new teachers is in place. So more than half of school leaders suggested in our survey that additional financial support was a strategy that can encourage more placement capacity. So the data on recruitment and retention appears to indicate that the supply challenge has eased for now. Um, the Office for Budget Responsibility forecasts that unemployment is likely to peak in 2022, so the wider labour market is likely to remain uncertain for a while yet. Um, but the so that short-term economic uncertainty outside teaching does provide support for the economic case uh, for a teacher pay freeze in 2021. But pay freezes, we think, are unlikely to be sustainable beyond that um, as the wider labour market recovers. Um, so how do we go about warding off another supply challenge? Well, so teachers pay has fallen in real terms since 2010 and only began to rise again over the last couple of years. Um, the pay of similar professionals have been broadly similar, um, but teachers pay has become less competitive than this particular comparator group over time, which may have contributed to the supply issues that we were seeing. The OBR forecasts some growth, uh, in real terms earnings from 2021. So keeping teachers pay competitive needs to be a consideration in the autumn spending review. 
So this red line shows the three and half percent increase in 2020 plus the pay freeze, and then forecast what a prolonged pay freeze would do to teachers' pay. So increasing the uncompetitive pay would risk another supply challenge developing once the labour market recovers. So we think that for the spending review, the government should make plans for teacher pay rises of, on average, at least two and a half percent a year. The orange line shows that, based on current forecasts, that's the minimum that's required to maintain the current level of competitiveness. So we also think that the system for independently scrutinising pay decisions needs to change a little bit. So as I said, the I think the economic case for a pay freeze this year is reasonably strong, but the cases for the case for a pay freeze is beyond that are a lot less clear, clear cut. So if the government decides that a pay freeze in 2022 is appropriate, then currently there's no statutory role for the STRB to scrutinise the merits of that decision. Uh, and we think that independent analysis and challenge is really vital for effective decision making and is something we need. Uh, so I'll finish there as I've gone on for too long, uh, but we'll finish by paying tribute to the great efforts of teachers and senior leaders in the past year. Um, the teaching profession has an enormously important role to play in the nation's post pandemic recovery. Uh, and my hope that teachers well being is adequately supported uh, and remains a priority. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, so we're now going to move into our panel um, session. I would just reiterate that if you've got a question, please do submit it in the chat function and mark it, um, send it to the host, um, because we'll have some time for Q&A later on. Um, so now moving over to our first um, panellist, who is Emma Hollis, who is Executive Director of the National Association of School-Based Teacher Trainers. Over to you, Emma. Thanks, Cheryl, and thanks, Jack, for another fantastic and really helpful report um, summarised beautifully in your slides. Um, I think two key issues that I'd like to just touch on in, in the five minutes I've got. The first um, uh, that is important to talk about is the impact on recruitment. And we fully support uh, the report's recommendation that um, the current up uh, swing in applications isn't seen as a fait accompli and something that we can rely on uh, on a long term view in terms of attracting applicants into uh, initial teacher training. It would be a mistake to take a short term view in any policy decisions going forward. Um, and wouldn't it be lovely if we could get to a stage where teaching is an attractive profession, irrespective of the state of the economy? And I think policy needs to focus on that and not rely on uh, downturns in economy to solve or even temporarily our teacher recruitment um, challenges. Um, there is also a question over whether teacher supply models as they currently sit are indeed accurate. We don't yet know what plans are for a post COVID recovery in schools. And it may be that as uh, the report points out in terms of workload already being excessive, if policy means that additional capacity and we suspect it will additional capacity is needed in school, then it may well be that additional teachers are needed to support that post pandemic recovery and the period of time that that may take could easily swallow up the additional 20 odd percent that we've already seen come through the system and could even drive demand in future for the need for further teachers. I think it's also really important to note the difference in subjects and um, my genuine fear for a post COVID pandemic recovery could be a narrowing of the curriculum. And I think that that's something that we need to be really wary to avoid. Um, I my hope for the future is that uh, we have a broad and balanced curriculum that offers children the opportunity to uh, experience a breadth of experiences and not something that narrows down to a, a small number of subjects. And so it, it is important to note the difference between uh, applications to different subjects. Um, and not to lose sight of that in all of this. Um, there's also something around whilst we don't dispute the economic argument for reductions in bursaries, there is um, an important discussion that needs to be on the table that sufficiency doesn't sufficiency of su supply doesn't necessarily mean high quality supply. And there is also a question mark over the field of applicants who are able to train to teach without financial support. So there's a social mobility question there in terms of if you are reliant 
on being able to afford a year without salary and to take on additional student debt, then that isn't going to um, be open to all, all facets of society. And we will be narrowing down the types of people who can apply. We, we see that in primary in particular, uh, in terms of are we attracting a breadth of applicants from different backgrounds? And um, we think that that could be improved through a more consistent approach to the funding that's offered for initial teacher training. Um, the second uh, item I just want to talk about briefly is um, oh, one other thing on, on retention as well. Um, the, the increase in applications to initial teacher training is, is of course, balanced by increased retention, um, which, which may reduce uh, perceived the need for, for new teachers into the profession. Uh, but what we don't yet know is whilst we've seen a short term uh, reduction in turnover of staff, are the people that would otherwise have left the profession in this year going to stay for the long term or will will in fact we see a bulge in people leaving the profession, everybody who would have left in this year and the normal rate of turnover coming in the next couple of years. So that's something else to keep an eye on. Uh, the second issue is around uh, supply of placements and that was absolutely true for the sector as a whole. We did see a real concern around placements at the beginning of this year. Um, I think it's really important to, to recognise though that that through our own surveys, um, we picked up on the difference um, for types of provider and their ability to leverage placements in the schools that they worked with. So for um, smaller local partnerships who had very close relationships with their school communities, our own um, research showed that actually they had far fewer issues in um, securing placements because of the nature of the, the close working partnership they had with the schools. So I think it's important going forward with, with any um, uh, adaptations to the ITT market that we protect the ability for very close local partnerships um, and providers to work with schools whom are uh, invested in their ITT and who will um, bend over backwards to make sure that they continue to provide ITT places for the providers that they work with. Um, and finally, I just want to echo, it was it's fantastic, the recommendation around mentoring capacity. We absolutely agree that the fundamental uh, challenge that is facing early career development, ITC in particular, but early career development as a whole, is the capacity for schools to provide the mentoring that we know is so central to making that an effective um, early career pathway for new teachers into the profession. And so that recommendation, uh, all recommendations we support and that recommendation in particular I'm pleased to see because uh, we know that the, men, the the capacity and the quality of mentors can can be the real difference between um, how successful somebody's early career development goes. Thank you. Thank you very much Emma um, and now I'd like to pass over to Ian Buckham. Ian is Chair of the Paul CEO and Director of Schools Trust and the leading DfE's IT. And over to you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you also from me, Jack, for a fascinating overview of this uh, important report. I've just got three observations to make briefly. Uh, the first is on the first section of what was presented on teacher well-being and job security findings. Um, you know, clearly, we absolutely have to recognise the uh, enormous impact the pandemic has had on people right across society, uh, both in professions comparable to teaching and others. Uh, and we mustn't lose sight of the commitment that the public services have shown, including teaching, to keeping society running through the pandemic. Uh, I do think, though, that it's important to get under the surface and look in a bit more granular detail at the findings that are contained in this report. Uh, under the surface of the high level messages. Uh, there is this insight that teacher distress levels did remain persistently below those of other professions for most of the 2020 pandemic period. And I think that that is worth just taking note of. Uh, once they rose in November and, and caught up broadly with other professions during September and October, when schools were still back, teacher distress levels were below those 
of other comparable professions. It may not be a particularly popular observation to make in some quarters, but I think it is just useful for the teaching profession to take note of that when we're deciding on the pitch with which we choose to project ourselves in the public debate. I think also it's interesting to note specifically on the happiness indicator that teachers felt less happy at the beginning of September on the return to school as, as a teacher of many decades. I recognise that phenomenon ever that it was perhaps, uh, but again, getting under the surface when we look at the sense of feeling whether or not the job is worthwhile the sense of feeling that we're doing something worthwhile uh, amongst teachers remained significantly higher than the same feeling in other professions. And it's great that teaching still provides that sense of doing something important and worthwhile. Uh, second observation uh, I'm going to make is about working hours, and I think there is something for us to reflect on here. Uh, as Jack has noted, reported working hours plummeted in the first lockdown. We don't know exactly why that was, obviously, because we don't know exactly what teachers were and weren't doing. Uh, in many schools, uh, early uh, re remote teaching was in the uh, early stages of development. That might have had something to do with it, or it might be that all the peripheral activities that happened in schools when they're actually in session weren't happening, uh, and that contributed to it as well. But then those working hours went straight back up again when schools returned. Um, I, I, and I think there is a challenge for us there to continue thinking about. Personally, I've long thought that there's still too much wheel reinventing going on in education on a small cottage industry scale. Obviously, nobody wants a one size prescriptive, uh, one size fits all approach to curriculum and teaching, but surely there must be ways of applying perhaps some of the lessons that we learned during the pandemic. And I'm thinking particularly about initiatives like Oak National Academy here to streamline the work that teachers do, think in a more system and scale way about teachers' workload. Think about how to remove some of the redundant features of teachers work without feeling guilty about doing so in order to make it sustainably more manageable, not just when there's a lockdown on. And then just thirdly and finally for me, uh, an observation on the provision of training places for initial teacher trainees. I was actually fearing that the data on this might look worse. Uh, even though the report indicates that there have been challenges in finding training places this uh, autumn. Uh, but actually the fall, if just to take one indicator in secondary schools, the average of 6.7 trainees per secondary school to six uh, isn't as bad as I thought it might be, although obviously the impact of it has been exacerbated because there are more trainees in the system. But this is actually a restatement, really, of an existing problem. ICT providers have long reported that securing placements for trainees in suitable schools with suitable mentors is a challenge. And achieving sustainable, high-quality partnerships uh, being core to the effectiveness of IT is something we perhaps need to think harder about. How do we get greater coherence, greater stability in ITT partnerships? And how do we use the system levers that we've got to create a stronger sense that participating in ITT is a core part of the activity of every school and trust? So that, that's the question and challenge that that finding raises for me. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Ian, and I'm very pleased to pass over for our last panel contribution to Professor Dame Alison Peacock, who is Chief Executive of the Charter College of Teaching. Thank you very much. And um, can I join the other panellists in congratulating you, Jack, and NFER and Nuffield in this research? Of course, leading the Charter College of Teaching, anything that provides great insight into the teaching profession is something that I'm very pleased to engage with. I think it's of course, you know, the, the events of the last year have been so awful for so many of us and everybody has tried very hard to just carry on as usual. I think it's fair enough to say that the, the worries that teachers had 
are in line with the worries of other professionals because of course we were all as a society knocked by something that we had never experienced before but i also listened carefully when you were talking about the particular impact on our senior leaders and i wonder whether that is particularly the case in our smaller schools because if you are leading a small school you maybe only have your chair of governors you maybe have one or two other members of the senior team and the burden on our senior leaders shoulders during that time has been immense i personally have engaged with many many colleagues in a senior leadership position over the last year some of whom have frankly been feeling really quite desperate and this is to do with the fact that our teaching profession is so keen to get everything right and i think this links very much with the second issue around workload because ian's right you know there have been initiatives such as oak which have been incredibly welcome during the last year but it seems to be almost within the DNA of our teaching profession that colleagues constantly want to do more and then do some more and then do more again, which is what happens when, when you're in the classroom at the end of the day, which is why teachers never ever will say to you, that's everything finished, jolly good, everything done, all my displays are finished, all my books are marked, all my children have been spoken to, all my parents have been contacted. I mean, it's just never gonna happen. And so I wonder whether that issue around teacher perception about workload which I think is very real, actually, is partly to do with this fact that it's such a people based job being a teacher. And there are so many of them that you are interacting with as a colleague on a daily basis, whether you're a classroom teacher or whether you're a, a senior leader, that actually, of course, the job will never be finished and it will never feel as if it's finished and it will always feel as if there is more that can be done because that's part of the commitment of being a, a great teacher is you constantly want to make the difference. I was pleased to see that teachers felt that they were able to make a difference and that this was one of the things that contributed to their sort of mission, their, their desire to um, continue to kind of do good, if you like, because we could see the impact that our schools were having on our communities. We could see the ways in which communities were looking to our schools and wanting advice and help and guidance and leadership, frankly. And this is one of the things that, that has meant that it's been so hard for leaders because of course when you are in a leadership position you have to look as if you are in control you have to maintain maintain calm professionalism whilst also battling with constant changes to guidance and constant concerns of your community i think essentially when we're looking at that mentoring role this is really important for the future of our profession because what we're doing at the Chartered College is really wanting to build career pathways, really wanting teachers to see that becoming qualified is only the first step on a career long development schedule, on a, a process of constantly refining and developing and enhancing one's skills and one's knowledge. And if we don't have high quality mentors in our schools and we can't encourage that, then there's a problem. So to summarise, I would say it's brilliant to see this work. It's also really important to remember that our profession is made up of so many highly committed individuals all doing the best they can. It's great to see that our recruitment figures have gone up, but it's not surprising. We've seen this before as we've, as we've discussed. What will be a real test will be whether we can build and maintain the culture in our schools. That means that our school leaders stay beyond the crisis and that those teachers who are coming into our profession also find a profession that is worthwhile that means that they want to stay too there's so much that we still need to do but thank you very much indeed for this insight thank you thank you very much Alison um, so we're now going into our Q&A session um, I'd like to start by um, giving Jack the opportunity to kind of respond to any of the comments that the panel have said but also a couple of specific questions on the research the first one is about which roles are included in similar professionals in your analysis. And then there's another one about which secondary subjects um, are the ones where recruitment targets are still very unlikely to be met. There are two very good questions. Um, yeah, so actually there's an important piece of context within that kind of our definition of professionals. So um, it's based on people in all kinds of different professional occupations. So from IT, IT professionals, librarians, lawyers, journalists, all kinds. Um, and it also includes health professionals, so nurses and doctors. Um, and actually, so interestingly, we broke down the 
the data on the GHQ well-being finding to see if it was driven particularly by you know an adverse impact on the well-being of health professionals this year, which you might well uh, expect. Um, but it didn't seem to be uh, driven by that. So it was kind of it was much more general than that. Um, so yeah, it, it's all kind of professional occupations. Um, but we do uh, reweight the data so that it looks a bit like teachers. So it has the same kind of um, majority female, uh, same age distribution and same regional distribution as teachers. So we can be reasonably confident that any differences are not being driven by that. But of course, there's always differences between occupations which are, are not fully captured in the data. So we should absolutely uh, keep that uh, in mind. Uh, in terms of secondary subjects that haven't uh, met the target. So I presented some data about which subjects hadn't met the target last year. Um, but it's also worth saying that the targets are likely to be overestimates uh, because they're based on what we knew about what we thought we knew about how many teachers were likely to leave back in 2019, which has obviously also been changed by the pandemic. Um, so it's difficult to get uh, a really good picture um, of exactly um, where we are on that. But it seems like physics is going to be continue to be uh, a struggle to recruit for. Um, maths uh, and also modern foreign languages, although, as I say, th there haven't been any targets um, published this year by the government in terms of what it's trying to achieve on MFL recruitment. So once that is published, it'd be uh, interesting to see where the MFL recruitment is likely to come out. Thanks very much, Jack. Um, and now I've got a question for, that follows up um, some of what Emma was saying, so I'll ask Emma to respond to this first which was very much about um, the DfE having acknowledged recently about the recruitment kind of increase being temporary. Um, and the question is, does this not reinforce the need for a bursary strategy to be one that sets bursaries for a number of recruitment cycles rather than on a yearly basis? Um, so it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. So I would argue, yes, I think uh, because of the points I raised around um, equality of opportunity and ensuring that there is a a kind of fair access for um, for everybody in terms of applying to initial teacher training. I think uh, it is a public service profession, and ideally, I would I would have uh, fees paid centrally so that people weren't taking student debt in order to train to be teachers. I think that would level the playing field uh, immensely. And in fact, DfE's own kind of financial the way they're going to change their financial reporting means that. Um, student debt will look different and therefore it could well be a change that that could come um i don't think there are plans to but i think i think they should uh the, on a very kind of um blunt economic um treasury point of view you can see why they do what they do because there is an argument to say that public funds shouldn't be spent recruiting people to a profession that would uh, apply to that profession, whether the funds were there or not. So you can see that the, the very blunt economic uh, arguments for it and why uh, the government quite rightly is held to account for how it spends public money and the Treasury asks those questions. But I do think that the, the argument is much more nuanced than that. And I think we need to be talking about who we're attracting to the profession and who we want in the profession and um, how financial support can ensure that we, we do have fair access. Thank you. Um, and we heard from Jack a bit about from schools were saying the barriers were um, in your comments and various of you have mentioned this issue about mentoring capacity. So I wonder if I can come to you first, Alison, to tell us a bit about what you think is needed to help solve the mentoring capacity issues, particularly given the um, ECF uh, rollout from September. <laughs> How can I solve that in one fell swoop? Well, it's it's to do with the capacity across the profession. And too often we find that very new teachers themselves are asked to be mentors when maybe they are literally just still finding their feet. So this has to be something that is understood to be a priority across schools, that it's not something that you just give to someone as a as a, an experience builder during their, their career. It's something that actually is, is foundational. Now, one of the things that we've seen during the pandemic, I think, is the way in which colleagues have worked together to great effect. We've seen much greater obvious collaboration. We've seen uh, collegiality across schools, within trusts, um, across regions. And this is all, in a way, this is all an extension of that, that um, need for mentoring. This is about how do we as professionals see our role in building others, supporting others, helping others to um, 
gain further expertise. So I think, you know, everything is tied together. The more that we have a, a culture where we, we privilege these things, the more likely it is that we will be able to find time to support our new teachers to the profession. But some of those findings around placements, for example, I suspect, particularly again within smaller schools, are to do with the fact that one more person to manage and support during a pandemic when you're trying to keep everybody safe just felt like one more thing that was probably going to be too much. So I think generally there is a willingness and a real warmth towards building the profession. It's just that we've been in circumstances that have made this particularly difficult at the moment. Thank you, Alison. Um, Ian, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, but we've also had a um, question in, which is about what impact the um, ITT market review is hoping to have on this matter, which if you're able to answer, that would be helpful. Well, thank you, uh, Cheryl. I'll say something about the mentor question, because I think it's a, a really interesting one uh, and is obviously not irrelevant to the initial teacher training market review. So I agree completely with uh, both Emma and Alison that mentors play uh, a central role in initial teacher training. But, uh, I, and I also agree with Alison, that uh, not it's not necessarily, uh, it can be, but isn't necessarily the right role for somebody who is themselves uh, in a very early stage of, uh, of uh, their teaching career, although there are exceptions to that, and I wouldn't want to rule it out completely. But I think, you know, there is something here about the quality and scale of training and support that mentors get. And I think there might be some questions that could legitimately be asked about the extent to which providers of initial teacher training are incentivized to put in place uh, very rigorous and detailed support for mentors. One of the key things in initial teacher training is that trainees get aligned messages from all aspects of training. So that means from any uh, inputs that they have on uh, theory and research uh, to messages that they get from teachers who may meet in their teaching practice schools, right through to the more detailed messages that they get via feedback, for example, uh, from their specific mentors. So having really good quality training in place and a good supervision for mentors, I think is key to making them successful. It isn't good enough simply to say, uh, you've been teaching for a couple of years, you know uh, a, a little bit about teaching now after two years, you can be this person's mentor. Uh, I mean, I'm caricaturing here a little bit to make the point, but it is really important that mentoring is taken very seriously and the investment is made in the preparation and training of mentors if ICT is gonna be successful and it's the providers who have got to take the lead there. Thank you. And um, we're coming to the end soon, so I'm going to ask a couple of points and go around um, asking Jack and then the panel. Um, so, firstly, we'll be, we've had some questions about the potential for a bold in um, people leaving the profession um, and what we can do to sustain the improved teacher retention if we can do. Um, but I'd also think it's interesting to think about the extent to which we can keep those school leaders that Alison was talking about, that particularly um, found the last year or so challenging, but also make sure that the do teaching and kind of support, we keep the what, those that are entering. So picking up on what Emma and others were saying about this being a kind of a sustained career that people want to go into rather than kind of the stop gap or when the economy um, is suffering more. So over to you, Jack, first. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, the, the, the short term uncertainty does give us some breathing space in terms of that supply challenge. You know, there's there's like there's going to be increased, there has been increased recruitment. There's likely to be fewer teachers leaving, but that's only going to last as long as the outside labour market is not performing. So all of those issues that we've been thinking about for the last five years in terms of uh, solving <laughs> the teacher supply are still relevant and, and still matter. So there's there's definitely a, still a role um, <clears throat> for for pay. Um, and there's definitely, you know, workload is the most cited reason by teachers for why they leave. So, you know, continuing to look at uh, workload and resolve issues there is it remains important. Policy changes like the early career framework, making sure that they're well implemented uh, and follow through. Because I think, you know, there's a danger in policy making that you you focus on the immediate priority, and you know this may become less of a priority immediately. 
but it will soon come round as being a, a, as a um, a priority again, and 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 that's where kind of those the, those long term um, uh, stages of policy implementation become really important. So, you know, not taking your eye off policy uh, implementation, such as the early career framework, continuing to focus on workload, and to think about pay in the medium term. You know, there's an opportunity this autumn as part of the government spending review to think about what pay looks like and to really plan for what does it look like in the long term when the labour market recovers. Thank you very much. Can I go ask um, Emma to respond next, please? Thanks, Cheryl. Um, education support have done some really interesting work around the links between feeling appreciated, well-being and therefore retention. And, and a recent uh, really large scale study that they did um, showed that during the pandemic, whilst teachers felt very well appreciated by their colleagues, their leaders, parents and their local communities, the level of appreciation they felt from government and the media was shockingly low. And I think that the impact that that will have on the profession in terms of how it sees itself and how it thinks the government and the media see it could be enormous and is really unfortunate because actually there was an opportunity there to really celebrate the profession. And for some reason, uh, particularly across mainstream media, the teaching profession seemed to be the only public service profession that was fair game uh, during the pandemic for some pretty unhelpful and unkind messaging. Um, I think that one of the ways government could show their appreciation for the sector is to trust us more. I think there is, um, Alison commented on the amount, sh the sheer scale and volume of policy change that uh, school leaders are having to manage at the moment and the system as a whole is having to manage. Now, some of that, of course, has been necessary policy change in, in response to the pandemic, but there is additional policy change that continues to be rumbling along in the background. Um, and I think that we need to be really careful about the scale, the speed and the um, short term uh, approach to policy change that seems to be pretty typical over the past few years. And I think we need to take a much longer term view of policy, a much more measured approach uh, with much more consultation and allow the system to uh, govern itself, which I truly believe it can it can do given the time and breathing space to do so. Thank you, Emma. And finally, Alison. Thank you. So I think the early career framework is a huge opportunity here. Um, we've been, we've developed an early career framework hub at the Chartered College with lots of videos, lots of resources, We're holding a festival, you know, teachers coming into the profession, working with um, initial teacher education providers, but also with teaching schools and skits and so on. I, I don't think they've ever been as well um, catered for, even though we've had a pandemic, ironically. So there's, there's a lot. Uh, and I know that Oak is also producing resources now as well. So there's a lot that we can do for our teachers as they come into the profession. I think we just need to look after everybody at every stage. And I've clearly, I've already talked about the school leaders, but they've stepped forward, you know, and I just wonder whether um, they have found a new collective courage and maybe just maybe they'll hold on to that. That would be my hope. If it's born out of professional rigour, wanting the best for every child, wanting the best for their school and their community schools, then I'd say, fantastic, let's keep that going. So I'm always um, the optimist. I'm, I'm full of hope that there are there's lots that we can do that means that we not only keep our profession, but enable them to be joyful in the work they do too. Thank you. Thank you. And over to Ian. So I think what you do is use the highest quality evidence to invest uh, in a coherent, planned way in continuing to develop teachers, invest in their expertise over time. I think the ECF and the MPQs are both excellent ways of doing that because that way you increase the sense of uh, self-efficacy that teachers have in their job. And as you increase self-efficacy, you increase job satisfaction. And job satisfaction is key to the retention of great teachers. Thank you, Ian. I think that's a really good um, comment to, um, to end on there. So as we are approaching the last minute or so, I'd just like to um, thank all of our speakers today. So to Jack and the wider team at NFER, um, for your contribution to the um, event today, but also for the project. Um, and to, of course, to our panellists, to Ian, Emma and to Alison, thank you very much for all your really um, interesting insights. And I think also your optimism for how we can tackle this long-standing 
issues um, for the future. And everybody that's been listening and submitting your questions, I'm sorry we couldn't get around them all. So thank you all. <laughs>